to the bridge one more time. For you made me pray. You call me out. For you made me pray. You made me pray. No fear can hinder now the light.
going to today talk about um, cultivate a generous mindset, embracing the power of giving. Cultivate a generous mindset, embracing the power of giving. Now, I actually want to talk to you younger people because we have a generation of younger people here that's amazing. You are actually making more than what your parents make. We live in an amazing time. There are so many things that are shifting in our lives. And we need to understand generosity very, very early in our lives. Very, I said very early in our lives. To learn it as a principle. You know, here at New Life, we don't pre, I've been to churches every time they give an offering, the pastor preaches a 15 minutes ceremony to move people to give, to lift up their hanky in the space and give. And when they give, then he will send them a bottle of oil. Man, we do none of those things here. Because I don't think that the power of giving is in all those material things. The power of giving is in our hearts. It's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. So we don't talk about it very much. In fact, I, we, we, I sometimes get pushed by some of you who say, Pastor, why don't you talk about giving here at New Life like other churches do? The reason I don't, because I sometimes assume that people have caught the culture. That is a culture. Because I thought, man, people should give without even asking them to give. They should cultivate a generous mindset. I learned this whole idea of cultivating a generous mindset when I was around 18, 19 years of age. I'll never forget. So I have four points here. I want to start with, number one, our generosity should be deeply rooted in our recognition of God's goodness in our lives. That's why we give. That's why we are generous. We are grateful. God has been good. Has God been, has, been, has God been good to you? Man, God has been good to me. God has been good to us. I know some of you in high school I know some of you in colleges. Today, I really want to address you younger people because I know you. I've seen you for the last, wow, 24 years. So I'm coming after you as new tithers and new givers in the church. I want you to be saved and make a decision to become a tither and a generous person in the house of God. Number two. Our generosity should stem from our profound love for God, his people, and his kingdom. We love God, and we love his people, and therefore, we give to the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God. Number three, our generosity should be grounded in our personal relationship with God. Generosity grounded in our personal relationship with God. It's never about numbers. It's about a relationship. Now, we have different relationships with God. God, Jesus Christ, is my personal savior. He saved me from my sins. But let me tell you, I've had an amazing relationship with God. God as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides me for my needs. You talk about someone God has provided for, man, I am number one. I have seen the provision of God in my personal life for in my ministry, in, may, in ways I just can't fathom. Number four, our generosity is a tangible expression of our spirituality and worship. You know, when we give, we are worshiping God. Sometimes when we bring that basket or those envelopes or the number up there, man, that's when some people say, mm -mm, this is not the music. And they switch off. And they go home before the service ends. But let me tell you, that is a beautiful moment. It's a time to worship God with the gifts and the blessings he has given you. So generosity springs from the depth of my heart. I choose, 
a choice I make with unwavering conviction. It's a choice I make with unwavering conviction. Why? There are so many people outside here teaching. Man, sometimes I listen to the, the, our radios, and man, I listen to what people teach about giving, and their thoughts are completely off. It's about money instead of a conviction. Instead of a conviction. I do it out of conviction. What is my conviction? My conviction, number one, I want to honor God. That's the conviction. I want to honor God. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And this aspect of honor comes with a promise. And the promise is that then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. That's the promise of God. Now, Let's put money on the side. Actually, God calls us to honor him in every area of our lives. Every area. Man, everything you do should honor God. Your career should honor God. Your marriage should honor God. We should live a life of uncompromising when it comes to the things of God. I am afraid that... More and more, I see Christians compromise their faith. So the whole idea of generosity is about honoring God. I do it out of honor. I honor him. I love him. And how do you do it? With the first fruits of your crops. Now that becomes a little bit uh, uh, challenging, especially in our culture. My money to take it to the church. No way. So we actually all end up doubting the churches. And why do you come to church when you doubt the church? You shouldn't come. You should stay at home. Why do you go to the hospital when you doubt the doctor? You know, you, you, that's why you should always find a doctor and a hospital you trust. So that you go with your entire heart trusting that they're going to take care of you. I honor him with the first fruits. And God says, your bonds will be what? Will be filled to overflowing. These days, it's no longer the bonds, but it's, it's our bank accounts. It's what we do. It's the blessings God brings into our lives. Number two, the conviction is that I want to express, to express the gratitude overflowing from my heart from God's abundant goodness. God is good. God has been good. God is good. Especially when it comes to Rwanda. God is good. Man, we've built a country that's so beautiful ourselves, and we are here to enjoy it. God is so beautiful. God is so good. The goodness of God overflows in our lives. Now, I know we may have a sense of um, an a contentment in some areas of our lives, but can I call you to contentment? Because actually God has been good to every one of you. Because I know many of you. That's the bit of being a pastor in the same place for 25 years. Because you can actually see people and the journey they have taken. So we, 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 it comes from the heart. Giving is about the heart. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, chapter 9, verse 5 to 11, Paul writes the Corinthians, and he's writing the Corinthians in light of the Macedonians. The Macedonians were much poorer than the Corinthians. The Corinthians were much wealthier. But the Corinthians were not generous. Being wealthy doesn't make you generous. In fact, your generosity is not determined by how much you give. Your generosity is determined by how much you keep. What determines your generosity? So he writes the Corinthians and he says, So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. You know, Paul was serious. And he said, But I want it to be a willing gift and not give any grudgingly. You realize again, it's about a heart. 
that's full of God's goodness. Generosity is not about numbers again. It's about my heart, the state of my heart, my connection with God. I'll skip some verses and go to verse uh, 7. You must each decide in your hearts, in your heart, how much to give. Again, it's a decision of your what? Your heart. What to give. It's not a point of excitement. It's not a point of being convinced. It's an issue of conviction. Much of our generosity is out of being convinced. Instead of a conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's why many people have been manipulated into things that look like African witchcraft till they give. Okay? I, and he says, I, want, I, don't, I don't give re reluctantly or in response to what? To pressure. You don't have to be pressured. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, joyfully. And God will generously provide all you need. You see the response again? God will provide you generously all you need. And let me tell you, you need more than money. God doesn't say he will provide money for you. God says he will provide for all your needs. Sometimes our needs are friendships. Sometimes our needs are emotional. Sometimes our needs, not sometimes, all the time our needs, our need is good health. Man, not to be in King Faisal tonight or the hospital tonight is money back into your pocket. Did you know that? It's a blessing from God. Not to be in a hospital for a, for a year. Like you haven't been to the hospital. You haven't been hospitalized for a long time. I'm not talking about checking on a doctor to check your teeth or checking on a doctor to check your, um, your pressure or blood or whatever. I'm talking about being hospitalized in a hospital for a month, for two months. Man, that is a lot of money back into your pocket. And God says, I'll provide for all your needs, including your health. And then you'll always have everything you need and a printer left over to share with what? Others. Why does God give you? God gives you so that you can share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered where? Forever. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. What a beautiful thing. They are good deeds. Man, you want your money to carry eternal value. Deeds remembered forever. Deeds remembered into eternity. Remembered forever. So that, that's a spiritual aspect. That's not physical. He has an eternal perspective as you look at it, as you think through. A spirituality touched, attached to it. For God is the one who provides the seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, what will he do? He will provide and do what? Increase your what? Help me. Come on, read out. Increase your what? Increase your what? Come on, turn your, your neighbor and tell him, increase the resources. Who gives increased increase resources? Turn to your neighbor. Increase the what? Increase the resources. Okay? Increase the resources. May I tell you something? God does not have a problem giving you money. He doesn't. God doesn't have a problem giving you resources. He doesn't. But God has a problem. And his problem is that it's hard to get resources through you. Can I repeat that? It's hard to get resources through you. It's hard. And if God can find someone, through him, he can send resources to others. God uses that person. 
Now, one of the places that is used to distribute money in our economy is called a bank. Isn't it so? Banks are used to distribute money. It's not their money. But it's used, bankers, the money they have in the bank is not their money, it's our money. They are used to distribute resources. And you realize that banks are rich because they are used to distribute resources. So if God can find someone to distribute resources on his behalf, because there are so many poor people, there are so many needy people, there are so many kingdom projects and activities and the preaching of the gospel and building churches and paying pastors in rural areas who live in poor areas and they need to be supported. You know, if God can, God will. If God can, God will. Let me tell you, if you can provide a room for someone who doesn't have an extra room to sleep in, God will give you a bigger house. That's simple. If you can, and God sees your heart, that you're going to be willing to give someone a room in your house who doesn't have a place to sleep, God will give you a bigger house. He will. So the big house is not about you. It's about him. Till it's about him, it's not coming. <laughs> and if it does come, it's going to come with a lot of sorrow and hard work and loneliness and emptiness. Can I hear an amen? amen? He will provide and increase your resources, then produce a great harvest of what? Of generosity. In who? In you. In me. Thank you, the one who said in me. In me. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be what? Generous. You always have something to give. And when we take and, and when we take your gifts, see. To those who need them, what will they do? They will thank God. What does that mean? They will worship God. They will worship God. Look at the spirituality of generosity and money. It's actually activating lives everywhere to worship God. Lives everywhere to worship God. You know, sometimes you look at money as just pieces of paper that belong to us to buy things we want. It's much more than that. It's a spiritual connection. Until you get that spiritual connection, you can't find financial freedom. You make more, but you always need more. You realize that? You make more, you need more. You'll always live in a state of not enough. And you'll always pursue it. And that's the concern right now I see our younger generation is going through. They are living in that state of wondering, will I have enough? Will I be poor? Will I be rich? <laughs> Let me tell you, God is going to take care of you. That's what I know. And God is going to provide for you. That's what I know. He's a faithful God and he has a relationship with us. That moves me to tithing. Tithing is the foundation for cultivating generosity. It's the foundation. Like it's the starting point. It's the foundation. Let me tell you. Some of you, I mean, I mean, uh, some people think tithing is a big deal. Tithing is not a big deal. Let me mess you up. Tithing is not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Now, if you're a new believer and you're a member of New Life, this is the direction. Listen to this. It's not a big deal. Because the whole idea of tithing is giving back what belongs to God. You haven't even started giving. We start giving beyond our tithe. In other words, people who are learning to give, they learn to tithe. When you're learning to give, to be generous, you're learning to tithe. After you have learned how to tithe, then you start giving. That generosity is not tithing. Tithing is very important. It's the foundation on which we build the rest of our generosity. 
is the foundation on which we build the rest of our generosity. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10, the Bible says, bring the whole tithe, where? In the house store, that they may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. Now listen, it says, in the New Testament, we don't tithe legalistically. In the New Testament, we tithe as a principle of generosity. We tithe as a principle of generosity. Okay? We don't go back to, 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 to the law. Now, the the principle of tithing, I'll be teaching the theology of tithing um, a few weeks from now. Tithing did not begin with Moses. Tithing began with Abraham before the law of Moses. Okay? Abraham in the book of Genesis he gave a tithe okay, to Merek Zedek before even the law of Moses was written. So it's a principle. And you want to understand it as a principle, a foundational principle to our generosity. Now it says, bring the whole tithe. Where? Where? In the storehouse. And in the storehouse in this context, he was referring to the temple, to the house of God. Because the Bible says, you take it to the storehouse of God. For you, your storehouse in this context is where you regularly fellowship. In other words, you don't want to be a consumer. You want to participate in the grace of God where you go to fellowship. You don't want to be a consumer. It's an unfortunate thing to be a consumer every Sunday. You want to participate in the community where you live. You want to make sure that there's light, there's water, there's life, there's everything that it takes to run the ministry. That is the storehouse. But you also want to give your church an opportunity to be a place where poor people can come and find help from the church. Because sometimes I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about the kingdom of God, to be about the church in the storehouse that they may be food. It's not the charity. Storehouse, it's in the house of God, right here in this place where we are. Because you know, it, it's, it gives you a connection to the community, it gives you a connection to the church. Let me tell you, where you put your money, you have a connection. That connection may be physical, may be spiritual, may be emotional, but you are, com you are connected. So, so we, we, we kind of learn to be attached to the church and the community that feeds us, that they may be food in the storehouse of God where we are going to church. Can you imagine you are an immigrant living in New York, making $150,000 a year. You drink coffee every day at the church where you go. The pastor preaches to you. I mean, you, you, you go to every buffet at the church and you send your tithes back to Africa. There's something wrong. You haven't yet understood the principle of belonging to the family of God where you are. Every time I move to any community, I find a church first, and I want a sense of belonging and participation in that community. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, bring to my storehouse a full tenth of what you earn. And the Bible says, test me, says the Lord. I will open up windows of heaven for you and pour out all the blessings you need. He says the first 10%. If I make 100 francs, it's, 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 it's 10 francs. Thank God it's 10%. Anyone can. If I make $100, it's $10. It's no problem. If I make $1,000, then it becomes 100 If I make 100 thank God, then it's growing. Now, I don't know why God say 10%. God would have said 20%. God would have said 50%. God would have said 90%.
God would have said, bring it all. It all, anyway, belongs to him. But God is good. You wouldn't have anything. You wouldn't be alive. You wouldn't be really having some food. So God said, you know, it's just 10%. But really the whole idea is that the 10% is from what belongs to him. Because even the 90% we have belongs to our God. Everything you have in this life is a loan from God. We are living on lonely oxygen. We are living on lonely health. We are living on lonely life. Everything we have is a loan from God. When God wants it, he says, bring it. And man, you go. So everything belongs to him. So why does he do that? Obviously, God does not need your money. God does not need anything from you. But I really believe that the reason we tithe for me is the number one is an act of gratitude. I'm being thankful to God. I just want to remind myself everything comes from you and I wouldn't have anything if it were not God. I wouldn't even have this, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have this if it wasn't for you. So in my gratitude for what you have done for me in the past, what you do for me now, and what you do, you do for me in the future, I put God first. Because in anything you put God first, God gives it back to you. If you put, your marriage first, if you put God first in your marriage, your marriage will stay strong. If you put God first in your career, your career will stay strong. If you put God first in your education, <laughs> let me tell you, even your education will prosper. Everything you put in the hands of God, let me tell you, God gives it to us in abundance. So it's the whole idea, okay, of saying, God, I am thankful. Number two, it's an act of priority in the present. What does it mean? God, I want you to be number one in my life and I prove it by putting you first in my money. God, I want you to be number one in my life and I demonstrate it in the hardest part of my life. Let me tell you, you may say you love God, but it's really just lip service unless you put God first in your money and your time. Don't tell me how much you love God. Show me your checkbook and your calendar. Show me your checkbook and your calendar. Show me where you put your money and where you, you put your time. Those two things will show me whether you love God or love shoes. Whether you love God or love cars. Whether you love God or houses. Show me. It will show us where you put your time is very important. Number three, it's a statement of faith. It is saying, God, I know all those promises in the Bible that say that when I put you first, you will bless me. To provide that I am trusting you, I'm going to put you first in my money. First, God says, let's have a little Contest here. Test me and see. There is no verse in the Bible I've ever seen where God says, test me. Here God says, test me. May I tell you, some of us have tested God for years and God is faithful. God is faithful. Our God is a God of miracles. Let me tell you, God never intended that we live on our salary. My salary is, an, is, is a token of thanksgiving from my employer. But let me tell you, God is able to provide for my needs when I have a job and when I don't have a job. And actually, I have seen God provide for me more even when I don't have a job. 
He's Jehovah Jireh. He provides for our needs. He takes care of us. And I think he, we, we have forgotten him. The principle of God is providence. We have forgotten something has happened to our generation because we have credit cards and we can get loans and we can do all these things that never existed in the 70s and the 80s, even in the 90s. So we trust the banks and loans. But let me tell you, God can provide for every need we have. When we go to him in prayer, you'll be surprised the kind of miracles he can do. Friends, I have prayed for miracles and I have seen God perform them. One after one, after another, after another, after another. Miracles of God is providence that are far beyond what I can ever make. Because our God is a generous God. Let me finish. So, when am I supposed to do it? When am I supposed to give back to God? Now, things have changed. For me, I do what I call planned giving. So actually, I plan my year of giving. But there are moments. There are moments when the Spirit of God moves. And this moment, it's about something supernatural about the, generation, the, the generosity. Then, man, I throw my budget away. We talk about the miracle of generosity in that moment. When that moment comes, I just let it go. Now, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul gave the Corinthians a way to give. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, on every Lord's day, that is Sunday, the first day of the week, you should put aside something from what you have earned during the week and use it for the offering. This amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you to earn. Now, in our culture, some people now are being paid every two weeks. Some people are being paid at the end of the month. Some people don't actually know fully how much they are going to make till December, till November. That's why you have to, to plan how you are going to do it. If you are a businessman, sometimes you actually need to finish your financial year, calculate all your taxes, calculate all the things you have to do, find out how much you've made in that year, and cut the biggest check ever. And that check makes many people tremble. But what we forget, that is about God. It's about God. In other words, what he means here is that you put it aside. You put some thinking, some prayer. You put your heart to it. You don't do it randomly. You pray about it. You think about it. You write it down. You pick a calculator and make good calculations for the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, we live in a time when people actually don't think about it. So they pay their tax at Java and pay their tax at Bobbin Coffee, pay their tax at the restaurant, pay all the things they pay. And then, oh, they remember Sunday morning when they are seated in the church. How much did I keep? We're actually giving God leftovers. I can't give God a leftover. I want to take time. I want to worship through it. I want to pray about it. I want to put my heart into it. I want to put a plan into it. I want to integrate it into my culture. In the way I do things. That's what I call cultivating a generosity mindset. It's a generosity mindset. You cultivate it. You grow into it. You move into it. It's your way of doing spirituality. It's your relationship with God. You have a financial relationship with God. The God who provides for your needs. The God who gives you progress every year. The God who opens up a door for a bigger job and a bigger job every now. The God who leads you to greater heights in your finances. You want to have a relationship relationship with him. Friends, when you learn this miracle, you can easily move into financial freedom because you understand it, because you get it, because the pastor doesn't have to shout over your head over money. 
What a, a shock. Shocking shock. When pastors shout over our, our heads over money, it shouldn't. It should be lifestyle. It should be a culture. It should be a way of living our lives. Let's stand up on our feet. It should be a way. It should be a lifestyle. It should be something I've grown up to love. Lord, we come before you as a church. May you forgive us, Lord, where we've not been faithful. May you draw us back in your house and building your kingdom, glorifying your name now and forever I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.